Hello everyone, welcome to this month's Solar Oregon's How to Go Solar and Storage Workshop. My name is Abby Jager, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a program manager here at Solar Oregon. This is a reoccurring workshop that we've done every month for home and business owners across the state for over 15 years. The goal of this workshop is to arm you as a consumer with the information you need to get solar and or battery storage. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, the agenda for today will be covering many aspects of solar and battery storage. We'll start by taking a look at how solar works. We'll see the components in a system, learn about a process called net metering that allows you to get credit for energy you export to the electrical grid, and see how solar can save you money on your utility bill. Next, we'll take a look at how solar contractors will assess your home and figure out if solar is the right option for you, and look at some common issues that can prevent you from going solar. Then we'll take a tour through the exciting and popular topic of home battery storage and see how a battery can allow you to use power when the grid is down. After that, we'll learn about the incentives available to you and walk you through some example budgets. We'll wrap up by talking about contractor selection and answering any questions you have. So first up, a little bit about Solar Oregon. Solar Oregon is a 501c3 nonprofit that has worked to encourage solar and storage adoption throughout Oregon for over 43 years. And while I'm talking about Solar Oregon, I'm also going to launch a few polls just so that that can get started. All of these polls are completely optional, but please fill them out in order to help us get a sense of who is in the Zoom room with us. So as I was saying, Solar Oregon is a 501c3 nonprofit. We focus on providing reliable and impartial consumer education, working to build the clean energy community and performing outreach and some policy advocacy. Our main program and the longest lived one is our How to Go Solar and Storage workshop, just like this one. And we also host solarized campaigns, solar tours, zero energy showcase, expert panel discussions, and many more different types of events. Go ahead and let the poll run for a few more seconds, then I'll move on to the next slide. Okay. Um, we are a member-based organization, so this work is made possible by people just like you. If you'd like to donate to Solar Oregon, please do, you can do so at bit.ly slash donate to SO, or you can learn more about different events we do by following our Eventbrite or social media at Solar Oregon. Okay, finish this one, launch one more. We have some great upcoming events, including the Green Energy Series on April 6th, an Earth Day Oregon event in, that we'll be releasing more information about that's going to be happening in April, and our Solar Winery Tour at the beginning of May. So if you want to be involved in some of our other future events, like I said, a great place is to sign up for our newsletter or follow us on social media and Eventbrite. Now, this webinar is made possible by the Energy Trust of Oregon. Energy Trust of Oregon is an independent nonprofit that focuses on providing access to affordable and clean energy for homeowners throughout the state of Oregon. Um, they are a great resource for clean and renewable energy throughout the state and do lots of great work. Thank you, Energy Trust of Oregon, for your support. And going right now is the last poll so don't worry, I'm not going to be asking you all that many more questions. Um, throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we'll be going through those to help answer any questions you have. Don't feel like you need to wait until the end of the presentation in order to put them into the Q&A box. You can do so at any time, and I will see them at the end. So now, without further ado, let's get started on how solar works. So this is a diagram of a typical home solar system. You can see the house in the middle of the diagram. 
And you can see the large PV panel over here on the left, also known as a photovoltaic panel is the official name. When sunlight hits the PV panel, a voltage of electricity is generated and the type of voltage that is generated is DC electricity, which is different than the AC electricity that your home would run on. So from your PV panel, the volt electricity then travels to a special device called an inverter or microinverter, which we'll be talking about more of in a second, in order to convert the DC electricity that is generated by the panel to electric AC electricity that is usable by your home. From there, it then flows into your home electrical panel to be used by your lights, dishwasher, or even charging your electric vehicle. If at any given point in time you're generating more energy than your home is needing, that energy will flow out to your utility meter. When you get solar, a new utility meter is installed as a bi-directional meter, meaning it can flow forwards and backwards. You can export power to the grid or export or import power from the grid to your home. This is, of course, for a grid-tied system, not for an off-grid system. Any excess power that you're generating, as I said, will flow out to that bi-directional utility meter and out to the utility grid to be used by your neighbors. So that's your a basic solar system. It's pretty simple, and we'll be delving into some details about each component next. So first up are the inverters. This is the device that converts the DC electricity to AC electricity. There are two different main types of inverters, a string inverter, which is pictured here on the left, and a microinverter, which is here on the right. A string inverter will take all the electricity from all your panels at once and convert it to AC electricity all at once. So for the eight to 10 panels, let's say, you have installed on your roof, it will take the power, you would only have one inverter, and it would convert all that power at once. In comparison, the microinverters, which are these black boxes right here on the right, are put on the underside of your um, solar panel and only produce, only take in the electricity from one to two panels at once. So if you have eight to 10 solar panels, you would have probably five to 10 microinverters depending on the needs of your system. Both options are installed frequently throughout Oregon and are both great. It really just depends on the need of your system, and that is a discussion you can have with a solar contract based on your specific needs. Oops, wrong direction. Next up is mounting. So, um, the um, or there are two types of mounting installed frequently throughout Oregon. The first is roof mounting, which is pretty popular in these density packed areas, and that is, like it sounds like, solar on your roof. Um, that's probably what you see if you're walking around your neighborhood. The other option is ground mounts. Ground mounts are pictured here on the right, and that's when, like the name suggests, you mount your solar panels on the ground. This is typically done in areas where there's a large amount of outdoor space, so more rural areas. Ground mounts can be more expensive because the conduit lines will need to run from the ground mounts back to your home, but they are used frequently and are a great option if you have the space. Now the vast majority of solar installed in Oregon looks like the panels that we've been showing so far. However, there's another technology that we're asked frequently about which are solar roof tiles. This is a solar product that also is your roof. So the roof tiles that would be installed are your roof. They also help protect your home from the elements. Multiple brands of solar roof tiles exist. However, they are still a fairly new product and not all solar companies install them. If you're interested in exploring this product, you'll need to seek out a company that specializes in it and has experience. Always ask your contractor how many solar roof tile systems they've installed and if you can speak with any other past customers. Um, another thing to note about solar roof tiles is that they can be more expensive. Price predictions, Price decline predictions have been made, however, none, none have quite come to fruition in the way that some people hope. So if you're waiting for the price to come down, you could be waiting for quite some time. So now let's go through net metering. As I mentioned before, net metering is the process that allows you to um, gain money when the solar you're producing is exported to the grid to be utilized by your neighbors. So let's illustrate how this works by walking through two examples, one in a typical, typical sunny summer month 
and one in a typical cloudy winter month. And next I'll show you an example power bill so you can see how this plays out on your bill. So starting with a typical sunny summer month, it's nice and sunny. The sun is warm, just like it was here today in Portland. And you are producing a ton of solar energy. As you can see, you are producing way more than you need, which is shown by this blue bar on the right. And so that green arrow is indicating the amount of credit you are exporting to the grid that is more than you need. This is credit that will build up throughout the summer months. And then comes the cloudy winter months. It's gray, it's cold. Suddenly your solar panels, while still producing some, you still get some solar energy when it is cloudy, are producing a lot less and yet your consumption from the grid has remained about the same. So you need to draw more power from the grid. In this scenario, the net metering credits you built up during the sunny summer months will um, be used during the cloudy winter months, offsetting your power and helping you keep that low electric bill that you want when you have solar. Um, while your net metering, so your net metering credit does roll over month to month. That's what allows you to build up the credits all summer and use them all winter. They do not roll over year to year. So the net metering year begins on April 1st. So any excess credits you have on March 31st are forfeited. We'll be talking about system sizing in a later slide, but that exact reason is why it's very important to size your solar to meet and not exceed your expected usage. So how does this net metering look when you're looking at your actual bill? Right here, we can see what your typical monthly bill might look like for a PG&E customer. So we can see in the box on the left, the read on your meter at the beginning of the month, the read on your meter at the end of the month, and then highlighted in yellow more towards the right is the number of kilowatt hours you used throughout that period. And in this case, this is negative 327 kilowatt hours, meaning that this customer exported 327 kilowatt hours to the grid throughout the month. So their billable kilowatt hours for this time period is zero and their year-to-date banked excess generation is 3,072 kilowatt hours. However, if we look over at this box on the right, we can see that despite this zero billable kilowatt hours, the amount due is not zero. It is $12.63. That is because just to be connected to the grid, you have to pay some amount of fees. This goes to basic grid maintenance and is, again, just what allows you to be connected. So while your bill won't be zero, the $12.63 is much less than um, a typical Oregon utility bill, which on average is about $70. Compared to the rest of the country, the Pacific Northwest Grit. It does enjoy relatively cheap electricity. However, electricity prices do increase year to year, as many of us recently saw this year. So system size. As I mentioned before, solar is both a highly modular system, and because your net metering credits do not roll over from year to year, you want to, it is very important to base your system size on how much electricity you need and not exceed your expected electricity usage. A common thing to discuss with your solar contractor is number one, how much electricity you use. They'll probably ask to see some of your recent power bills in order to get an idea and any lifestyle changes that might be coming for you. This can be adding someone new to your home or someone moving out or changes like getting an electric vehicle or switching to more efficient appliances. All of these will change your expected usage and you something to be prepared for when thinking of your system size. So how do you know if your home is right for solar? So no matter where you are in the state, you there is enough solar access within Oregon for you to get solar. Um, here we have a simple diagram that shows a home and its orientation with respect to the cardinal directions and the two extremes of the sun. So the sun at its highest point in the sky on the summer solstice and at its lowest point during the winter solstice. Um, you can see through this diagram that southern grooves are best for solar as the sun is always in that southern part of the diagram. However, no matter if you, as long as you have some sort of southeast or west facing group, you can usually get solar, assuming you check off the other features I'm gonna be talking about in a moment. 
Um, so yeah, even though we are a pretty cloudy state, we still do get enough sun and they can be, and solar can be installed on usually south, east, or west facing roofs. The only ones that are typically not installed on are north, northwest, or northeast facing roofs. So one of the things that can prevent you from going solar is shade. If here in Portland, we have some really marvelous old trees that provide really great shade. However, that can also prevent you from going solar as the sun cannot penetrate through the shade provided by the trees. So if a solar contractor can assess your roof and tell you if you are too shaded in order to go solar and worry not even if you do have some shade, a great option if you still would like to receive some solar power is looking into community solar. The next thing that can make your solar project a little bit more complex is your roof complexity. Um, here we have two examples. So on the left, we see a really complex roof. So while they have lots of south-facing roof planes, they're also quite small due to all the juts and angles on that roof. So any solar system array would have to be very broken up, which can lead to, to increased costs. In comparison, the roof on the right is very simple and would allow for one continuous array which would lead to lower costs overall. Um, next up is your roof condition and age. We recommend that you have at least 20 years of life left on your roof. This is because solar must be taken off when you re-roof your home and your solar panels can be damaged within that process. Um, if you have an old roof, we recommend that you wait until after you re-roof in order to prevent any of the extra costs removing and reinstalling your solar. Next up, as it relates to your roof, is your roof structure. So not only does what's on top of your roof matter, but also what is underneath it. In order to support the extra weight of your solar panel, you need to have trusses, as pictured here on the left, and not just rafters. Um, this is because solar adds a good amount of weight to your roof, and you want to make sure your roof is not going to cave in from that extra weight being applied. You, most newer homes do already have trusses, so you could be set to go. While I know a lot of older homes, and particularly the craftsmen that are popular throughout Oregon, usually just have rafters. If you do just have rafters, do not worry, as you can work with your solar contractor to add some extra support to your roof in order to make it solar compliant. However, this can add an extra cost. So, Next up, we're going to go through battery storage. So solar makes storage more effective. While solar on your own will not allow you to use power while the grid is down, if you have home battery storage, your solar can recharge your battery if it's nice and sunny out, and your battery can allow you to retain power for longer. This, the ability to retain power when the grid is down is known as energy resilience. So here's just a quick example of what solar and storage looks like. We have the battery pictured here on the left in the garage and solar on the roof on the right. Now, power outages vary in their causes, in their frequency and duration. In some areas, um, short outages are frequently caused by storms and squirrels. Um, and in other areas, we can have some short to medium length shutoffs known as public safety shutoffs in the summer where the power grid is actually shut down in order to reduce the fire hazard in the area. The entire Pacific Northwest, Northwest also faces the unique risk of a large earthquake, also known as the Cascadia Seismic Hazard. When this event occurs, it's thought the power may be lost in the Willamette Valley for up to six weeks. And on the coast, power may not be restored for several months. Important to know what type of outage you're expecting to endure so that your contractor can design a system to meet your needs. However, with that being said, it is important to note that we batteries work best for short and medium length outages and it can be prohibitively expensive or even infeasible to prepare for the extended outage event of the Cascadia seismic hazard. So, what about picking a battery? When it comes to picking a battery, there are many good products on the market. However, due to manufacturer certification requirements, many contractors specialize in one. So if there's a specific battery you have researched and you want to have installed in your home, make sure that is one your contractor is comfortable working with and has worked with before. 
it is also important to note that you cannot mix and match battery brands. So your solar panels and your battery can be a different brand, but if you already have a Tesla Powerwall, for example, you are unable to get an E2 battery. Most batteries have between 9 and 14 kilowatt hours of capacity, and some manufacturers make smaller units capable of only 3 to 4 kilowatt hours, and some make supersized units with up to 20 kilowatt hours. For standard household electrical loads, such as lights, appliances, many batteries will perform well. Um, and if you're intending to use the battery to back up a load that requires a lot of instantaneous power, like a motor, your contractor will need to factor that into the system design. So as I said, it's important to set your expectations properly as to what a battery can do. As I said, it can be prohibitively expensive to back up your home for any, your entire home for a very long period of time, such as in the case of the Cascadia seismic hazard. Therefore, what is often done is known as a partial home backup, where certain circuits within your home are moved to a separate breaker to receive power in the event of an outage, while the rest of your home would lose power. So here's an example of that. When you do a partial home backup, the way you do it is by creating an essential load panel, essentially a second circuit breaker and home electrical panel that moves the power specifically to those circuits and only those circuits are connected to your battery in the event of a shutoff. This does add complexity and therefore cost when designing your solar system. So when thinking about an essential load panel, the question is what needs power and for how long? The battery system sizing will include a detailed discussion on this with your solar contractor, but these two questions are the best way to think of it. Items most frequently chosen to back up include a refrigerator, some lights in common areas, and a couple of outlets to keep a charge on a laptop or cell phone. Next is when to install storage. So there's two different types of storage, AC coupled, which is installed after your inverter, and DC coupled, which is installed before your inverter. If you install your solar and storage system at the same time, it can save you money. Storage added to an existing solar system can include an extra cost as you have to pay for electricians and contractors to come out again, and if extra conduit lines and things of that nature. In addition, other inefficiencies can be introduced, including space constraints for mounting equipment near the electrical panel and more electrician labor, as I mentioned. Now, please be aware that batteries require a significant amount of dedicated physical space. They are ideally installed immediately adjacent to your electrical panel, which is typically in the garage. If insufficient space is available or all of the, um, an exterior wall can be utilized. However, this comes with additional conduit and can be aesthetically unappealing. By National Electric Code, batteries cannot be in crawl spaces, cupboards, or other similarly confined spaces. So here's an example of a two battery system so you can see just about how much space that takes up. So now that we've gone through all that, we're going to talk about the incentives and then go through how much these types of systems can cost. So first up is the Solar Investment Tax Credit. The Solar Investment Tax Credit, or ITC, is a dollar for dollar tax credit, meaning you can reduce the taxes you owe by 30% of the cost of your solar and or battery storage installation. This is an incentive that you don't receive immediately. You apply for it when you file for taxes. And it's important to note that if you don't owe enough taxes in the year in which you install, you can claim this credit over the course of several years. So quick disclaimer, the, so I am not a tax professional and this is not official tax advice. Please talk to a tax professional, and this is only for educational purposes. Do not interpret anything you hear today as official tax advice. With that being said, here's a little bit more about the ITC. So the ITC covers the cost of both solar and battery storage, and it can be applied to both traditional solar panels as well as solar roof tiles. The incentive is straightforward, easy to claim, and has been around helping countless of people go solar since 2006. However, it is important to note that you are ultimately responsible for claiming the credit correctly and getting the tax credit. As opposed to the next incentive I'm going to be discussing, this one is on you, not your solar contractor, in order to apply for. 
Um, there are also many myths about the investment tax credit, such as that regrouping costs can be claimed, which is false. If you have any questions about claiming this credit, you should seek guidance from a quality, qualified tax professional. Next up is the Energy Trust of Oregon Solar Incentive. This is a flat $400 credit for PGE customers and 450 for Pacific Power customers for solar installation and $250 per kilowatt hours for a maximum of $3,000 maximum per home for energy storage installed. In order to claim this credit, you must be using an Energy Trust of Oregon Trade Ally contractor. I'll be talking more about how to find one of those in just a minute. Um, is, so unlike the ITC, this is one that your solar contractor actually will apply for and receive for you, and you will just see the deduction on your total bill amount. Lastly, we there is one credit that is an beyond the IDC and Energy Trust of Oregon standard incentive that is only available to income qualified homeowners. That is the Energy Trust of Oregon Solar Within Reach program. This is a dollar per watt program where you can receive up to $6,000 for solar and $750 per kilowatt hour, up to $10,000 for added storage for Pacific Power Companies, Pacific Power Consumers, and 5, 000, up to 5,400 for solar for PGE customers and 10,000 for PGE added storage. And the household afford income threshold is very generous at $120,000 or just over that. So it's really great to look into even if you think you might not be qualified. So in just a minute, I'm gonna be going through some different budgets for solar and storage. So you can see how much this costs. But it's very important to note that these are just example budgets. The cost of a solar and storage system can vary greatly as these are highly modular and they are ultimately tailored to your specific needs. Um, reasons costs can vary for solar are the size of the system, whether or not you need to re-roof, any structural analysis within your roof, and how many incentives you can access. The, if you're adding storage, these costs also continue to vary, whether you're installing your storage at the same time as solar or not, how many batteries you're getting, if you're creating a central load panel, how far you're installing from your electrical panel, and again, your access to incentives. So here's a sample budget for solar. The average size of a solar system here in Oregon is eight kilowatts, so that's what we're using here. So your cost before incentives across the board is $32,000. From there, you get to take the Energy Trust incentive, making your out-of-pocket cost $31,600, just about, or $26,000 to $26,600, depending on your power company, if you are an income-qualified customer. From there, you can then take your 30% federal tax credit, making your final cost to consumer $22,085 or around 18,500 if you are income qualified. So now what if we're adding storage? So this is an eight kilowatt solar system with a 13 kilowatt hour storage. So your cost before incentives is 52,000. You have that added storage and you also get more incentives due to that. So 3,450 off the energy trust incentives or over 15,000 if you're income qualified, making your out-of-pocket cost 48,500-ish to 48,600 if you're non-income qualified and 36,500 or so if you are income qualified. From there, you then apply for that 30% federal tax credit, making your total out-of-pocket cost before energy savings just under 34,000 for non-income qualified and um, 25,500 or so for income qualified households. Lastly, if you're adding storage after solar, you have that 32,000 cost for your solar system across the top. However, the cost of your battery added after your solar system is an additional $23,000. That makes the Energy Trust incentive, you get um, 3,450 and 15,000, depending again on whether or not you're income qualified and which incentives you're accessing, making your out-of-pocket costs 51,500 or so, 
and if your income qualified, 39500 Your 30% federal tax credit is then taken off, decreasing that cost by 30%, making your final cost to be $36,100 if you're non-income qualified, and about $27,600 if you are. So those are some very big numbers. However, it is very common to finance your system. Um, there are some loans tailored to solar, which may allow you to refinance after you claim that federal tax credit. And some homeowners obtain a loan through a bank, which they have a pre-existing relationship with. Um, but some banks do not offer loans specifically tailored to solar. Your contractor may also partner with a credit union or another third-party broker, and they could offer you another financing package. And it is important to note that any interest payments on your loan will not qualify for the tax credit. And as with any major financial decision, please make sure you carefully assess your financing options before making any decision. So with all that being said, how do you get started? Well, I highly recommend you check out the Energy Trust of Oregon Trade Ally Program. I'm going to put some links in the chat right now, and that will include links for the Energy Trust um, Trade Ally Program, the Solar Oregon, and some and the incentives that I talked about. So the Energy Trust Trade Ally Program is rigor rigorously qualified solar contractors who have been vetted by Energy Trust of Oregon and been approved by them, and they are the only ones who can offer you that Energy Trust of Oregon um, incentive that I was discussing. They're familiar with all of Energy Trust design and installation requirements and are really great. You can find them by using Energy Trust of Oregon solar bid tool. You input your address and your information will be sent to three um, solar contractors who serve your area for a free quote. So this is that custom bid tool, the solar bid tool I was talking about. It is linked in the chat now. Um, you can receive um, quotes from many highly rated contractors, all of whom will be able to offer you that Energy Trust of Oregon incentive that I was discussing. So once you've selected a contractor, your contractor will complete all the paperwork for you except the tax credit. Um, depending on where you're located, permitting can take two to 12 months. However, once you do get your permit, installation is very quick at only one to two days, and your contractor will manage all inspections and interconnections. And once you're interconnected to the grid, you can start building those net metering credits and saving yourself money. So with all that being said, thank you so much for attending. I'm now going to start going through the Q&A, so please, I know we already have some questions in there, but um, they... We're going to start going through them now. Feel free to put in more. Um, so one question is, uh, one of someone here has had solar on their rooftop for six years. It's grid connected system with micro inverters. The local installer has been purchased by a big out of state entity and the local office is closed. Is there a way now to add minimal storage and islanding system? Do you think standard local installers might be interested? I would say yes. I know multiple households and families who have added more solar to their system after adding just a little bit, whether that is adding solar and storage again or just adding some more solar. Um, I would definitely reach out to some contractors on Energy Trust Solar Bid Tool in order to find some local installers in your area who would be willing to take on that project. Um, someone has said that they've heard net metering is under threat in Oregon. Net metering makes these systems pencil out financially for many. What have you heard about the threat to net metering? This is correct. Um, at the end of last year, Idaho Power filed a motion within Oregon in order to change their net metering rules for the Oregon residents they serve in Eastern Oregon. This was denied and they have said they're going to refile and following Idaho Power's lead, PGE has also said that they are planning to file something, but they have not filed anything official yet, so we don't really know what's going on at this point. If you want to stay up to date on what's going on with net metering, I highly recommend you sign up for our newsletter. We will be publishing information there as net metering is very important to making solar viable throughout Oregon. Um, 
Um, the next question is um, that when they used to give How to Go Soda workshops for Soda Oregon back in 2009, that's amazing. And I would love to get to know you and hear some stories from Solar Oregon back in 2009. Um, they always started by saying that investing in energy savings had a better ROI and was the first step before rooftop solar, specifically that $1 invested in energy saving was worth the same as $3 invested in rooftop solar. Their ratio has probably changed, but isn't the concept still valid? And you are absolutely correct. We highly recommend you look into some energy efficiency swaps before going solar, things like having better insulation and tighter ceiling windows and doors can make a really big difference in terms of the amount of power you need in the first place, which can help save you money in the long run by requiring you to not have quite as many solar panels purchased. Um, before I go on to the next question, I'm really quick going to launch the last poll. This is just a post-event survey so we can get some feedback on how you think we did. And while that's going, I will continue answering questions. Um, the next question was, why is there an energy charge on the bill when an excess was produced? That is just because you pay in order to be interconnected to the grid at all. So if you wanted to be completely island, like an off-grid cabin, you would not need to have that charge, and you would, but you also would not be able to draw power from the grid at night or at another time when your solar might not be generating the amount of power you need. Um, the next question is, are there alternatives to the trusses for finished attics? I don't know about that. I'm not an engineer, so I wouldn't know. If you want to email me at the email I put in the chat, I'm more than happy to do some research to see if I can figure that out. But if you're looking for a little bit of a quicker answer, I would recommend reaching out to a solar contractor and talking to them about your unique situation and seeing if they have any suggestions. Um, the next question is, are there any state solar incentives? So the Oregon Department of Energy does offer a solar and storage rebate. However, during this most recent legislative session, that rebate was not refunded. Currently, there is estimated to be about $6,000 left in that um, pot, and there won't be any more added this year. It is expected that that money will run out by June, which is why it was not discussed within this program. Um, yeah, unfortunately. The next question is, someone has a solar system with a bi-directional meter, but no storage. They have considered gaining an EV with vehicle to home capability. What is required to make this work? Um, based on what I know, vehicle to home um, charging, essentially using your electric vehicle as a mobile battery, more or less, to power your home when the grid is down, is not yet something that is at market. It's something people are very excited about, and there's been many promises about it coming soon. However, keep, nothing has quite come to fruition for that. I know there are some DIY systems, but that is not something I know too much about. Uh, it's something you would want to do some research on, and from what I know, it is not available yet. Um, yes, the next question is, will this be recorded for later viewing? Yes, this presentation has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube later, um, probably early next week. Um, and a link will be sent out to all of you. Oh, someone didn't get the links. I will put those in the chat again. Um, hopefully you can find them this time. If not, feel free to email us at info at solaroregon.org. I'm happy to send you any information you may want. Um, someone asked if we can tweak our initial survey to add an option from Southwest Washington. That's a great recommendation, and thank you for giving it. Um, last question I'm seeing. And feel free to keep putting questions in, is can, do I know any information about how to get around Multnomah County's requirements for getting solar? Their understanding is that it is very strict and they often turn down projects. Um, I know Multnomah County has some very long permitting processes and it can be very frustrating. Unfortunately, there are no ways to get around those permitting issues as it is stuff that they find necessary in order to get solar. Um, 
working with a trusted sonar contractor that is used to navigating Multnomah County systems would probably be your best bet. That is all the questions that I have received. If you have any other questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, I'll stay on for a few more minutes in case anyone has any questions brewing. But otherwise, I will hope you all enjoyed this and learned some great information. And as I said, the recording will be sent out later next week. Have a great night.